Welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. My name is Guy McPherson. My mission is to help trauma therapists be their incredible selves, to be human, to be real, not just a clinician. I'm a big believer in who we are is more important than what we know. And this requires cultivating authenticity, genuineness, and vulnerability, and that requires intention. You can learn more about my courses and workshops by going to the traumatherapistproject.com. That's the traumatherapistproject.com. Let's get started. Okay. Five, four, three, two, and one. All right, folks, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. I am very excited to have as my guest today, Christy Pearl. Christy, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Awesome. So Christy is a certified EMDR therapist and consultant in private practice in Massachusetts and Virginia, who specializes in providing EMDR intensives for adult children of alcoholics, dysfunctional families who are dealing with work stress and performance anxiety to create a healthy relationship with their work so they can be who they want to be today instead of who they had to be as children. Wow. All right. Um, welcome. So before we get going here, Christy, share with our listeners where you're from originally and where you are currently. Yeah, so I am originally from Virginia. I was born and raised here and went to college here. And then when I finished college, I left and went to Boston um, for grad school and lived and worked in in New England um, for uh, close to 30 years. And I actually have recently returned to Virginia um, with, you know, family in tow. And, um, you know, back here in Virginia, as of last year, actually, so I'm kind of building a new community here for myself, Mm -hmm. professionally and personally. And it just allowed us to be closer to to family and and which is, you know, really important um, at this phase in our lives. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So how the heck did you get into this field? (laughs) <laughs> well, like most other therapists, I got into this field because I'm wounded. <laughs> you know, we we <laughs> she smiles. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. No, it's well, yeah. you know, I can smile now. There right. were a lot of years where I wasn't smiling. And yeah. um, you know, I so just a little bit of my story. Um I uh you know, first considered being a therapist when I was a teenager, and I had that in my mind, I, and and very much born out of my own personal trauma history. Um, you know, I think it's something that draws a lot of us into the helping professions when we have known personal pain, and that's not always a conscious choice at the time. It's Mm -hmm. something I think we can understand better later because Mm -hmm. there's like the pretty reasons why we tell ourselves we go into helping professions. Like I want to help people. And we don't always, at least early on, we're not able, we don't have that self-awareness yet to understand, you know, why are we so drawn to helping other people? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we ourselves are looking for our own, our own healing and understanding. So, you know, I thought about that. And then, you know, when I was in college, I, I, I was doing well. um, And, but I was struggling in a lot of areas of life. I was just beginning my own healing journey at that time. Um, I am a child of an alcoholic. So I was very much struggling with my own um, journey there and just starting to understand what that meant for me. And Christy, hang on a second, if if I may. So what, what, what were you struggling with specifically? I think I struggled with feeling really isolated, feeling really different. I was also a first generation college student. So and this is back at, you know, I I graduated from college in 94. I started in 1990. So back then it there wasn't all the resources that are available now, you know, now if you go to college and you're first generation, you might be able to join a group or talk with someone about that. But at the time, it just wasn't part of the conversation, you know, mm-hmm. in general. And so I I just felt really out of place. Um, but I did well academically because one of my main coping strategies has always been to do well in school. (laughs) Um, You know, I was sort of that overachiever um, that school was like the place where I could feel okay Mm because home usually didn't feel okay. 
Um, so, you know, I was doing okay academically or I was doing well, really well academically. I'll give myself credit for that. Um, but was struggling socially and I just wasn't sure. And I was also struggling with what's my next step. You know, I think sometimes when we get to the end of that college road and we have to start creating our path, Mm -hmm. some of us adult children really struggle with that. Um, Even if we are overachievers, you know, I struggled with knowing how to be proactive in my own life, how to make choices, how to even claim that I wanted something, how to Mm -hmm. even say, I I really would like to have this or that, or this is how I see my future. I was struggling to do that at the time. And so what I ended up doing was um, going to grad school and got a master's degree in something that I really didn't care about, but my family really cared about. (laughs) Um, So I- What was was the master's degree in? Yeah, it was in criminal justice, of all things. So, you know, not totally unrelated field, but I didn't have a passion for that. But I, you know, at the time, it was like, oh, hmm, I'm a senior in college. I don't know what I'm going to do next. I know I'll go to graduate school. (laughs) You know, Mm -hmm. I'll just keep going because there was also a safety for me in having that prescribed pathway of school. It, it, It had always given me a tremendous sense of safety and security. So I went to grad school for criminal justice, and that was in Boston. Um, And then, you know, things started going from bad to worse. And I floundered around for a number of years and eventually found myself in um, a post-baccalaureate pre-med program. Because then I thought, okay, I'm not I don't want to do criminal justice. I know that's not my passion. That's not in my heart. So I want to be a doctor. I'm going to be a psychiatrist. And what I didn't understand about myself was that I do not have the aptitude for medical school. I don't have that spatial skill set. It doesn't come really naturally to me. There are other things that do come naturally to me, but I had never known those things about myself. I didn't have that, uh, you know, information about myself. And so when I went into that program. Where where, where was this was in Boston? Yes, that was at Tufts. um, Okay. Tufts University and wonderful program. But I was not. Part of my problem is every time I say I want to do something, I I'm able to try like I do like I get in, you know, <laughs> like I, <laughs> and and then this really led to my own personal rock bottom because mm. I struggled so much academically. Now I no longer had my safety zone. Yeah. And I was still having all the troubles in my personal life um, with just not knowing who I was, not having that identity, um, not feeling um, really not having the the love for myself, the, the, the self-love. And, and so I, I was struggling everywhere. And I I withdrew from the program and that was really rock bottom for me. That was a time when it was very, very hard for me. Um, And I thought, you know, I like something has to give here. So I ended up getting a job as a secretary and that was not where I had ever seen myself being. I was working as a secretary Mm -hmm. and I had a master's degree Mm -hmm. (laughs) and I was working as a secretary. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but that wasn't what was meant for me. Um, Mm -hmm. But I couldn't seem to find my way. And so at the time, you know, I was living in Cambridge and um, I liked the Cambridge Center for Adult Education. I used to take classes there, you know, pottery, you know, voice over, you know, like, yeah. And so one day I'm flipping through the catalog. This we did. We still did things in catalogs. This is in the late nineties, getting close to year 2000. And I saw a workshop and the name of the workshop was career decisions for adult children of dysfunctional families. Oh my gosh. That's what I said. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I thought I, I thought, oh, this is a thing that you mean, this, you mean there's a reason why I'm like this? 
you, you like there's other people that feel this way and no, no, hang on a second so yeah. prior to that had you been cognizant about any of, of that yeah. I mean, okay. I, so I did therapy myself for the first time as a teenager when my family was disintegrating my family of origin. Um, you know, my, my mom did a really good thing and took me to therapy because I was really struggling with depression. Um, mm. and again, this was like in the eighties. So, um, you know, this was like the time when like Phil Donahue was, you mm -hmm. know, like this is pre Oprah, you know, like I, miss Phil Donahue. Actually, I think Oprah was on by then, but you know, alcoholism or being a child of an alcoholic was just not part of the conversation. It just was not as openly discussed. Um, and so, you know, I didn't, when I was a teen, young teenager was the first time I knew what that was because my therapist told me. And so I had done some work then and I had done therapy on my own um, in my early mid twenties. So at that, I, it was all kind of happening around the same time where I was, I, I knew where this was coming from. I understood the, the why of all of it. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't mind sharing. Um, I know there's a lot of talk about diagnoses and labels and things like that. And people have different feelings about that. Um, for me personally, I was so relieved when I got the diagnosis of PTSD at the time, mm -hmm. because I then had a framework for how to understand why I was so depressed, mm -hmm. why I had been depressed since I could remember. Um, it gave me a way of understanding like, oh, OK, I have a trauma history like that explains this. There's that I can heal from that. There's something I can do about that. It's mm -hmm. uh, you know. Nuts. Right. Yeah. I mean, prior to that, it was like, I'm just depressed and that's just who I am. And I'm just a depressed person. And what, do, where do you go from there? You know, right, like, right. It's, it's not random. And that, that diagnosis gave me a, a, a way of understanding. There was a reason why I was feeling that way. Um, what, why did you get, uh, want to get into that pushback program? I think I was gradually moving my way towards something that was going to be more meaningful for me. And I mean, mm -hmm. I'm happy to say that now I'm doing what I, you know, feel I was meant to do. And I, mm -hmm. I dreamed for years of being where I am now. So I'm, I'm, I'm able to look back, you know, at, from, from this side of things now, but yeah, I, I, I think I just felt drawn to, healing, um, mm -hmm. drawn to being able to serve other people in that way. Um, and so it was like I was inching towards it um, mm -hmm. and, and doing what I knew how to do at the time. Um, so that's that's what led me into that program. I really appreciate you sharing your story and um, you really articulate what you went through really well and your realization of oh my gosh there there's a thing child of alcoholics so okay let's jump up a bit how did you decide to become a therapist and and specifically specialize in, in that Mm hmm. Well, I continued inching towards, <laughs> you know, it's it's been a long journey. You know, I it took me a while to really learn how to let myself want things and how to let myself take action towards those things. And to really, I see it as allowing myself to be my authentic self, not doing for a living what I think other people want me to do, not um, kind of, you know, for about over a decade, I I was on a, I mean, I've been in the healthcare field now since, you know, I, I got, I eventually went back to school for my counseling degree and that was in 2005. So, you know, I've been in the mental health field since then. Um, so that's what 17 years. Um, but, you know, I, I had a span of time where I continued 
doing the things that I thought I was supposed to do. And it led me into really interesting work for a while. I held, you know, I'm probably one of very few therapists who has actually worked in every aspect of this field. I've worked in um, community mental health. I've worked in managed care. I've worked in policy, you know, creating healthcare policy mm-hmm. back in Massachusetts, you know, and now I'm in private practice. And so I I actually have a really comprehensive understanding of, of the field, but none of like, if you asked my authentic self, is that what you really wanted to be doing all of those years? My authentic self would say, no, I, that's not what I wanted to, you know, like I wasn't put on this earth to create healthcare policy. I mean, as, mm-hmm. as valuable and meaningful as that is, I, I wasn't allowing myself to be my most authentic self. And if I may, so that to me is really interesting and uh, really profound. And your story really resonates with me and is very eerily similar to mine. And we'll talk about that later, but why do you think, why do you feel, or maybe you even know why you weren't honoring who you were in those choices? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. And it's, it's basically what I spend my time working with clients on now, which is, and, and, you know, having done that work myself, which is the fear for me, I I think the reasons are many and they're probably different for everybody. For me, it was absolutely a fear of being visible because I, I, your true self being visible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, when, and this is this is me. So growing up in a home where being visible was not safe. Mm. And, you know, I I won't share a lot of detail about that publicly. But, you know, I mean, when we grow up with a parent who is an alcoholic and, and you know, there were some scary times growing up. And so, you know, when you you grow up in, in an environment like that and this applies to me, um, being visible or being invisible is how I maintained safety. It's kind of how mm-hmm. I survived. I learned mm-hmm. to survive by fading into the background, which is almost hilarious to me now, where I am now, where I am extremely visible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I am I am visible in so many ways now, but for that was my um trauma response was you know freeze you know like disappear so i think that i brought that into a lot of areas of my life where i just couldn't and and this wasn't like a conscious thought you know like there's very little of our brain that's actually conscious like Mm -hmm. explicit it's like all of that old survival material that's living in our implicit brain, our implicit memory, our, you know, like the body keeps the score. That's why that saying exists, because it's not all in our thinking brain. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of unconscious material for me that needed to be resolved around allowing myself to be known, allowing myself to be seen and to be visible and, and actually believing that you know, good things are going to happen to me. How did that process for you become conscious? And what what were some of the steps, the initial steps Mm -hmm. that you started taking? Yeah. You know, I say this as a therapist, there are so many ways to heal. And I don't think it's one thing. I, I personally did so many things as a part of my healing journey and still mm-hmm. do, you know, I'm, I'm not done. I mean, I, I, we can always feel better, right? <laughs> um, I consider myself very much in recovery um, and I'm smart enough to know that, or, you know, maybe it's self-awareness. I'm self-aware enough to know that, um, you know, there's little, little gremlins that pop up every now and then that I pay attention to. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've learned how to do that. 
Um, but I, you know, I joke, I did everything. I read books, self-help books. I, I watched Oprah. I went to workshops. I, um, went to therapy. I went to church. I, um, you know, listened to podcasts or back then, like listen to, you know, CDs or, Mm -hmm. I mean, what didn't I do? <laughs> was, was it Christy? Was there, was it, was, I know there, there were a lot of things, but can you share with us something that did resonate with you that mm-hmm. maybe was like, holy crap. Yeah. 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 I will say in addition to the very good talk therapy that I had over the back then in those mm-hmm. years, um, EMDR was not something I had ever even heard of. I wish I had had an EMDR therapist when I was younger. Um, might have saved me a lot of grief. <laughs> but um, in addition to the really good therapy that I had, I would say allowing myself to reconnect with the things that were most meaningful to me, which for me was music. Mm. and my faith Mm. and allowing myself to do those things that for me was really the the turning point everything that has happened to me since the the time that I began to do that um really is because of that um you know and again like yes I did the therapy but And I I say this again as a therapist, that therapy isn't always, that's not the be all end all. That's not all of me. That's not my whole life is, you know, me, I am a musician. I am a, a, a learner. I, I love to learn. I love to have new experiences. I, um, you know, like reconnecting with those things is mm-hmm. what made probably the biggest difference for me. That's amazing. And it's so inspiring too. Um, walk us through how we decided to work with this particular clientele or the special mm. specialization. Mm-hmm. Well, that was an evolution as well. Um, you know, I've always worked with people with trauma, um, you know, even since the very beginning of my counseling career um, back in 2005. I, I've always worked with people with trauma and complex trauma, um, attachment trauma. And so eventually, I think as I allowed myself to be more of myself in my work, I and as I was working with clients who, you know, I recognized a lot of myself in these clients, Mm -hmm. I I started to realize this is something that I I'm number one, very knowledgeable in because I lived it. I don't know anybody that understands being an ACO. I mean, other ACOAs understand it, but you know, as a therapist, like I, I, I have that lived experience. Um, and I think it allowed me to embrace that more and more. And, and I remember just how hard it was for me. And Mm -hmm. I, I really, honestly, it's really fun for me to watch people heal and and improve and specifically when it's these types of concerns that i i deeply understand that i don't even i don't have to share that personally um Mm -hmm. but it's just my there's like a level of understanding that it's um it's very gratifying to be able to specifically speak to this problem Because I don't think a lot of people, I've actually only heard of one other therapist ever, even addressing the particular issue of career issues for adult children. And I think just my own lived experience just made that really meaningful for me. And I love working with people and seeing them get better in their, in their journey, in, Mm -hmm. in, to the, helping them pursue their calling. That's incredibly meaningful to me. Um, I really do um, 
cherish working with people who are mission driven. And I, I want I want every person to be able to share their uniqueness with the world. And I love helping them do that. There's nothing that makes me happier than to see somebody succeeding. Mm -hmm. And I know mm -hmm. how I felt all those years where I felt like I was failing and I didn't understand why. It, it, it feels to me and help me out here, but as a, 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 a child of an adult alcoholic, you know, it, it seems to me like you have a parent who's an alcoholic and there's so much attention there. It's like the child who has this explosive behavior mm -hmm. and it, it would feel to me like as a kid, so much attention would go to that, that you almost, do you lose sight of how that's impacted you? Or, mm -hmm. you know, when you said you had that, that light bulb went off when you read that, that mm -hmm. catalog, oh my God, there's a thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there's a, there's a question in here somewhere, but, and I understand, you know, every, well, everyone's different, but for this particular, for people who are uh, children of, of adult alcoholics, are there commonalities? Mm -hmm. in, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there absolutely are. There are some common traits of adult children of alcoholics and in in general. And then, you know, a lot of us are surprised to realize that it's not just affecting our personal lives, it's affecting our work. Mm. Um, so, you know, I think there are um, in general, there, there can often be a sense of over responsibility. So that that person who's always overdoing or they're always helping, um, they're the first one in the office in the morning, the last one to leave at night, they'll always help everybody, they'll pick up the slack. Um, and, you know, that's not necessarily wrong or bad. One thing I work with my clients to to differentiate is, are you doing that because you're just that excited about your work and it's coming from a place of abundance? Or are you doing that out of fear? It's mm -hmm. not the thing you're doing that's bad or good. Right, it's right. why. Are mm -hmm. you doing it because you're you you won't feel like other people will like you or they will they won't approve of you as much or you know they'll abandon you somehow if you don't do those things so it's it's you know it's it's tricky sometimes yeah. to, to parse it out um but you know it, it's there are there are a number of common traits but i would say that you know that one usually stands out, especially when we're going to work. Um, there's there's a, an over concern and over, overdoing um, mm -hmm. with, you know, kind of making other people happy at your own expense. Got it. Got it. Um, speaking with Christy Pearl, Christy, what's the best way for people to get in contact with you? They can go to my website and uh, it's christypearl.com and, um, you know, they can schedule a consult with me. They can um, download. I have a, a guide um, that people can download if they'd like to. Um, it's called a business relationship check-in. Hmm. So I really do see our relationship with our work as a relationship. And so this check-in will help people begin to identify what kind of relationship do they have mm -hmm. with their work, um, you know, and, and, and identify any areas that might be red flags that they could be falling into some of these traits um, at their work. Got it. Got it. Well, Christy, um, you're phenomenal. I mean, you have a really amazing way of articulating your experience that I think is uh, just I ideal for what I'm trying to do here on this podcast. And because of that, I'd love to have you back. Oh, um, I would love year. to. Yeah, I'd love to <laughs> I it. feel like we could keep going. <laughs> I, I totally agree. Um, I think you're awesome. And I can't oh, wait to get this thank out. You. Um, thank we'll you be so in touch. Much. I really appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Take care. Have a great rest of your day.